Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Two private space stations, each designed to replace the aging ISS, are almost ready to head to orbit. One of these stations is utilizing very conventional modules, and also companies who have built a lot of space station modules in the past, whereas the other company is pushing forward with a much more aggressive and ambitious plan. But is the more ambitious solution that gives a lot more habitable space actually safe? And why is NASA moving forward with private solutions anyway? Is it really a good idea to let private companies take over the legacy that the ISS has built over the last 20 years? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So, for years now, I have been reporting on the progress of the private space stations that are going to theoretically replace the International Space Station when it is retired at the end of this decade. And it looks like some huge progress has been made lately, both in terms of Sierra Space and Axiom Space. Recently, Axiom just sent up their third mission to the ISS, an all-European mission, but that's just a small part of what they intend to do in the future. The first module for their new space station is going to be attached to the ISS in less than two years. Now, what do I mean about attached to the ISS? Well, you're going to find that out here in just a bit, but we also need to talk about the insane progress that Sierra Space has been making on their life inflatable modules. As most of you probably know, I've been very, very well disposed towards this particular solution for living out in space because we're talking about an enormous amount of habitable space being contained inside a very small module when we're talking about how much fairing space it occupies when you first send it up. But is an inflatable solution really safe? I mean, how tough is it? Is it going to be able to deal with the massive pressure differentials that exist out in space? Can it stand up to the impact of a micrometeoroid or a piece of space junk? Or is the life module actually just delivering a whole lot of habitable space without a whole lot of crew safety? And also, why does NASA want a private solution, a private replacement for the ISS anyway? Isn't it better to have a government initiative that NASA can control a bit better than a private space station that might go off the rails? Well, let's find out. So let's talk a bit about the more conventional solution, the so-called Axiom Station. Now, I don't want to take anything away from Axiom because there's a lot of innovation involved with this station, but also this is a little less risky in terms of the concepts being used and the deployment of the station as well. As you can see, the modules are being attached to the ISS, and the reason they're doing that is so they can take advantage of the power and life support that the ISS can supply while the modules are being turned up and being made operational before it becomes a free-flying station. So the first module is called AXH-1 or Axiom HAB-1, which contains crew quarters, research and manufacturing capabilities as well, and it will come into use the moment it's attached to the station. It doesn't have to wait to be turned up. And then, predictable we have AXH2 or Axiom HAB2. This also contains crew quarters along with research and manufacturing capabilities. And we also should talk about why all of this is so important. In microgravity, you can do lots of things that you can't do here on Earth. For example, there are unique types of materials, metals, rare minerals, that sort of thing, which can be manufactured in space in microgravity far more easily than they can be made here on Earth. For example, if you try to 3D print human organs here on Earth, well, the biological material tends to end up in a puddle at the bottom of a petri dish because of gravity. 3D bioprinting is far more effective in microgravity, and in theory, all of us could have our own 3D printed cloned organs out in space ready to be replaced in case any of them had problems in the future. 
In other words, organ banks could become a thing of the past. And that's just one of many examples of things that can be made in space that cannot be made here on Earth. So the third part of the habitat is AXH3, the Research and Manufacturing Module, which is a state-of-the-art research and manufacturing facility to do the types of things that we were just talking about, including, by the way, the construction of unique and original chemical compounds and metallic compounds, things you can't even make here on Earth at all, the kinds of materials that are worth millions of dollars per kilogram. So there's a hell of a lot of money to be made out in space if you know what sorts of industries to invest in. So by the time these three modules have been added, Axiom is gonna have a pretty good space station in place, but attached to the ISS, until they can get power turned up. So here comes the fourth module, the AXPTM or Axiom Power Thermal Module. This provides expanded environmental, life support, storage, and payload capabilities. And attached to this module is a solar array utilizing bleeding edge solar technology that's capable of providing a substantial amount of energy for the station. We're talking almost as much energy as the original ISS has available. So it's a smaller station with a smaller solar array, but it's capable of doing almost everything Everything that the original ISS is capable of doing, including housing a full-time crew of four and the occasional space tourist. Actually, it's designed to handle a constant flow of space tourists, and the interior design is actually pretty slick. Axiom has done a lot to make this station more pleasing to the eye, and on top of that, they've added this amazing feature, which I like to call the microgravity hot tub. And what it does, obviously, is provide a 3D environment that you can simply step into and be surrounded by the grand of the universe and the earth beneath you all the time. A big step up from what the ISS provides with its cupola. So really, really amazing things from the Axiom space station. And once it is fully assembled, it will detach from the ISS, becoming its own independent free-flying space station designed to replace the ISS in every considerable respect. And as I said before, Axiom is going to be sending up the first of these modules in 2026. So just around the corner, we're going to be looking at the beginnings of deployment of these replacement space stations. And by the way, Axiom has secured the services of Talis Ale to build these modules, and Talis Elenia is perhaps the most experienced company on the planet when it comes to building reliable space station modules, as they have already done it for the ISS a number of times, and are also building the IHAB module for the Lunar Gateway, so you really couldn't find a more reliable solution than that. So Axiom seems to have a really good plan going, although when it comes right down to it, these modules are not much bigger than what the ISS currently uses, and it's not much of a step up if we're talking about habitable space. But it certainly has its compensations. I don't think I would ever get tired of hanging out inside the microgravity hot tub, and that's going to be a huge attraction for space tourists in the future. And also, to be clear, Axiom is assembling a lot of the components in Houston. That is to say, life support systems, power, that sort of thing. The modules themselves are being built by Talis Elenia, but this is the first human-rated spacecraft or space station being built in Houston. But let's move on to what is, in my opinion, a more innovative solution, and that is the life module from Sierra Space. It took many launches and years to assemble the ISS. 
and the expense was unreal. Tens of billions of dollars making the ISS the most expensive human-built object in the universe. Life Module is designed to change all of that in a single stroke, providing an inflatable habitat that gives 300 cubic meters worth of habitable space in a single launch, or one-third of the capabilities of the ISS, meaning that you could deploy the entire habitable space of the International Space Station in only three launches, which, if you're using Vulcan Centaur, would cost roughly $300 million. So $300 million to deploy a space station every bit as big as the ISS. Not even $1 billion. An enormous cost savings. And it gets even better than that. As you can see, the modules have three floors. I mean, such a huge departure from the types of modules that we use today. We're talking house-sized modules rather than modules the size of small rooms. And for those of you who advocate that we just use Starship for a new space station, well, as you can see, the Life 3.0, which can be carried inside a 7-meter fairing, in other words, carried up by New Glenn, and definitely by Starship, is 1440 cubic meters, substantially larger than the entire fairing of Starship. Now granted, you could pull out all the engines and the fuel tanks and everything out of Starship to make it into an even bigger space station, but the amount of effort, the amount of missions that it would take in order to carry out such a conversion would be so cost prohibitive compared to what Sierra Space is capable of doing, which is deploying all this habitable space in a single mission. Now, some of you may be asking, okay, but is an inflatable module really safe? Well, it's comprised of a material called Vectram, a multi-layered material that is substantially stronger than steel. And in order to prove this, Sierra Space has been carrying out a series of pressure tests to determine just how resilient the structure of Vectran actually is. NASA sent a recommended level of 60.8 PSI, or in other words, four times the typical atmospheric pressure that a space station module is going to go through. And as I said, up to this point, Sierra Space has been carrying out these experiments with scaled down versions of the LIFE module. This was the first attempt at the full scale module. The first test did manage to get the test article up to NASA's recommended pressure level. However, it ran into some problems. Okay, you guys clear? 45 PSI. 50 PSI, 50 PSI, 55 PSI, 55 PSI, 61 PSI. All on the way to burst, go Sierra Space, go NASA. It's starting to go down in pressure. So maybe it's a leak on the test article and it's trying to overcome it. We're dropping just as fast as we were filling it. Although the test article made it to the recommended pressure, it didn't burst as it needed to do. They discovered that there was a problem with the pressure system with one of the valves. That was fixed because there wasn't a problem with the test article itself. And the next day, they were ready to go again. Today, we're going to be back in the control room for part two of the test. While we did surpass our threshold yesterday, we still want to burst our test article to really see how much margin we have. Go out, go Nasa. 55 PSI, 55 PSI. 63 PSI, 63 PSI. 70 PSI, 70 PSI. Here comes my number. 75 PSI, 75 PSI. Oh, no. 
As you can see, sometimes launching rockets is not the only exciting thing you get to do in the spaceflight industry. So the test article managed to reach 75 PSI, substantially more than NASA required, and five times the atmospheric pressure that it will experience in space. Plus, as you can see, there are many layers to the Vectran system. Layers that provide an extreme amount of protection to the hazards of space, including multiple layers of a Kevlar-like substance that will absorb the impact of micrometeoroids and also space junk. And also, Vectran provides substantially more protection against cosmic rays and solar radiation than typical space station modules do as well. So there are many, many advantages to this inflatable solution that, by the way, was pioneered by Bigelow Aerospace, but unfortunately, since they've gone out of business, Sierra Space has picked up the torch and taken over the technology, and they are the ones that are going to be deploying the first of these modules a scaled-down test module in 2026. And once again, to be clear, Sierra Space does not require the participation of Blue Origin in order to get their system up into space. The 300 cubic meter module can be deployed on Vulcan Centaur, and the life support systems and also power and propulsion, all of those things are built by Sierra Space themselves. The power and propulsion and control systems actually are based on their dream chaser spacecraft oh yeah that's another huge advantage that Sierra Space has over everybody else is the fact that they are building their own cargo and human rated spacecraft the Dream Chaser, which in my opinion is the most advanced, the most flexible, the most sensible method for getting human beings up into space, at least small numbers of human beings into space, and getting them back down again safely without having to go through an extremely violent high G re entry and also without an oceanic recovery and splashdown. This is a far more flexible way of deploying human beings in cargo go into space and bringing cargoes back as well. And of course, as we all know, Sierra Space is collaborating with Blue Origin to build the Orbital Reef Space Station, which is even more ambitious than the life module solutions that Sierra Space is proposing. But once again, they don't absolutely have to do that. They can deploy their own solution if they want to. And given the fact that Sierra Space was recently nominated one of the most pleasant places, one of the top places to work in Colorado compared to a lot of their competitors where the high pressure environment and also some of the lousy management has led to some pretty terrible ratings from ex-employees. It's really cool to see that we have a bleeding edge space technology company that's going up against some pretty powerful competitors that can still provide a pleasant work environment for their employees. So Sierra Space, along with Axiom, are going to be putting up these replacements for the ISS. And as I think you have seen, the reason that private solutions are better is because competition breeds innovation. And that's why we have these two very different but equally innovative solutions. Yes, I think one is better than the other, but I think both of them provide a better solution than the ISS ever did. The ISS was a wonderful first step into low Earth orbit, but Sierra Space and Axiom are going to take it to the next level. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's incredibly important to the future of my channel. And I'd like to welcome Vince Canal and Dr. George Kelly, my latest Patreon supporters. Thank you very much for helping my channel. And if you'd like to join them, all the details are in the description. And until we have a new space station in orbit or a dozen space stations, the more the merrier, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.